Japanese. I just did like three high level bullet points. Obviously there's a lot more that goes into it every day, but we do a lot with Giant Eagle, we do a lot with New Era. We'll work with our sponsorship group internally to pull those numbers for their mid-year reviews and mid-year reviews, stuff like that. And then like I mentioned a few seconds ago, these are all of our social channels. So obviously Facebook, LinkedIn, we only have one on LinkedIn, we have our Spanish and uh, Pittsburgh Pirates on Facebook, but on Twitter, we have a lot. And we brought them all, I like to say, in-house into our department, so we don't have people going rogue and posting things that don't align with the brand, part and the brand's voice, stuff like that. So that's them all listed out. Pittsburgh Pirates is the one we use all day, every day. But then we have our community group, the Pirate Ferret, PNC Park Events, our partnership account, Youngbox, which is our prospect account, which is great, love that. We got a dog this year. We partnered with Guardian Angels and PNC, and we're training the dog. So we have Pirates Club Twitter account, and then our Spanish account, Bucks and Canadians on our Twitter account. And then Instagram, we have a few more accounts, the Parrot, Main, Youngbox, Spanish, and then our dog also has an Instagram account. And then we thankfully only have one Snapchat and one TikTok because I refuse to let anyone else get a TikTok since they can all just post it on our main channel. And then first question for you guys, what social channels is your school currently on? Is anyone on social? Uh, so I'm a social media manager for the uh, We're on all the channels that you just <laughs> Yeah. Anyone else? Look, you speak for Quick Park Athletics, or you don't think we have Instagram, Twitter. Yeah. And are there. Okay. Yep, there are. And then she can go sign her on the Instagram, Facebook, as well. Are there any accounts that you guys are wanting to join or are interested in? Or just the main three? Welcome to our call. <laughs> so this is just an overview of a loose content strategy that we have for each platform. I'm not going to get super nitty gritty, but if you do have questions, I can. So Facebook, Facebook's who's older. It is a very interesting demographic. It's very negative, um, but they do enjoy photos. They love a gallery. And for us, they love historical moments, since it's used a little older. They were probably alive to watch Clemente, Sargil, Parker, so they love on this day stuff, and then they like big brand moments and big plays. So we may not post an RBI single on Facebook, but if Bill Hill Cruz is a home run, that's 100% going on Facebook. Twitter, I like to say, is your main news source, so everything moves so quickly on there, I don't care if O'Neill hits a home run, and then Brian Reynolds hits a home run five seconds later, it's going boom, boom, boom. Like, I don't care that it's on top of each other because we want to be first. We don't want to be beat by MLB Sports Center ESPN. So I don't strategically schedule and space out posts like you would on another platform just because your timelines are moving so quickly that it doesn't matter. Instagram, I put Instagram changes their algorithm every week because they do. It's my least favorite platform. Um, they're always pushing something different. I think since I've been here in 2019, it's changed tens of times. Right now they're pushing reels. They love Instagram reels and they love 4 by 5 since they changed. I don't know if it's half rolled out to everyone, but on your profile now instead of squares it's 4 by 5 So they want you posting 4 by 5 But with, does anyone know what Be Real is? The app, like kind of, I would say with Be Real, some users, especially younger users, are wanting to go back to like photo docs and filtered stuff. I know Kylie Jenner hates the algorithm and has like publicly said that, which is funny, but she did this with Snapchat too, and they lost millions of users, and so when people with these kind of platforms speak out, it helps us because they actually listen to them where they don't care. And then TikTok, I said out of the four main platforms, this one offers the most opportunity for growth just because it's so weird. Um, it's so fun, but there's no like true strategy. You think something's gonna perform, it doesn't. You think something's like meh, and you post it, and it hits 40 pages, and goes viral. 
So we've seen a lot of growth on the platform. Our growth goal is the highest on TikTok out of all of them. And I think so far this year, we've gained like over 100,000 followers with, we don't have anyone solely dedicated to the platform like some teams do. And then here are just a few loose um, things that we like to, guidelines like we like to go by. Post with a purpose, this is my big thing. Um, just because you can post something doesn't mean you should. Just because you have a pretty photo doesn't mean it's going to perform well or do well on every platform. And so I like to have a loose strategy for each individual platform. What's going to work on Facebook isn't going to work on Instagram. And then also post content on each platform that people want to see. People on Instagram don't want to see a random honest day moment about some player from 1970, but they do on Facebook. And so just knowing what each audience wants to see is super important. And then I just have this nice photo of oh no, Chris, we hit a home run. And we're going to talk about voice in a minute, but the copy that I used on that, we would not use on Facebook because they wouldn't know what we were talking about. But people on Instagram didn't know that was a TikTok sound. Quality over quantity. So kind of what I just said, just because you have pretty images doesn't mean you need to post every single one, doesn't mean you need to post everything. And so you just need to be selective in what you're posting on each platform and focus on posting high quality content instead of just posting a post. Um, when David Bednar was named our all-star, we were on the road. And so we didn't have anyone from our social team or our content team there, but our director of baseball communications was there in the clubhouse, and so he filmed that for us, and he added some lower thirds on there, and then we posted it on Twitter and TikTok, I think. TikTok had, had over 600,000 views, and then Twitter is almost at 250,000, so while it's not something that's like super, super produced, it was just shot on an iPhone, because we were there and in the moment, it did well. And then the voice. These are some random screenshots that I took. But like I was talking about with the O'Neill Cruz thing, each platform has a different voice. Our Facebook voice is very boring, very informative. We're not doing anything special there. On Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok though, we're able to have a little more fun, show off personality, be self-deprecating in all those moments when we are winning. I'll start with in the middle. I know you talked to Brownie earlier today. His new thing, whenever we turn double play, is Zip Zap Zoo. I don't know. But our fans love it. They make these stupid little memes that I love dearly. And so when we beat the Brewers last homestand, we had Keeper and Hayster a huge double play. Brownie used that call. We used it in the copy. And then we took this meme and responded to the Brewers' final score with this beautiful image of Brownie. And then on the left, we swept the Dodgers in LA um, in May, and so we went crazy on Twitter. We ratioed the daughters, we ratioed the MLB account. Um, so we had a lot of fun, our fans had a lot of fun, and then I just like this Tiger Speed. Um, obviously, Mickey's not breaking any records, he's really slow, but I thought it was funny, and it did really well, and just kind of his last for rock. Okay, resources. Another question for you guys. What do your current resources look like? Because obviously the resources we have are going to be a little bit different than everyone else. By resources, I mean how many people are posting, do you have a photographer, graphic designer, do you do every single thing yourself? Anyone else? We have uh, coaches can post, post uh, stuff to the account, but otherwise it's myself. Yeah. And does each individual sport have its own account, or do you have? We're trying to get there. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So here are just some ideas. Obviously, we have more resources. We have full dedicated content team with graphic designers, videographers, and then myself, I oversee our social coordinator, we have an intern, and then there's a director of social. So we're a big department, we've doubled in size since opening day of this year even. Um, so I know it's gonna look different 
what we can do versus resources that you have at your schools. But one thing with our intern and interns that I've seen in the past, finding students who are interested, especially in high school, in social and content creation can be really valuable because they're going to be looking to get their foot in the door and you need content. So it's kind of a mutually beneficial relationship. I knew I wanted to do this when I was in high school. And so I was on yearbook and some journalism and stuff like that. So trying to see if there's anyone who's interested in doing that um, can really help. And then determining what you can do well and focusing on that. Obviously in social, there are so many different platforms. There's so much happening all the time. And you're not going to be able to dedicate all of your resources to every single one. So trying to figure out what you do well, what users, fans resonate with, and then focusing on that can be really helpful. And then, but it has, I think, 47 million views on TikTok. So this is just an example that you don't have to have the greatest equipment, but access is what matters. And being there and trying something new, and like I said with TikTok, your video could go way more viral than it even on the higher post because you never know what's going to perform. And then I can go get my phone because I think this was the last thing. But if anyone has any questions, I can go more in depth about certain things. How do you uh, approach content from like a brand perspective when, let's say, like your team is losing or they're not performing? Um, how do you approach that from a social media manager side? So we've lost every season that I've been here. <laughs> and when I was at the Raisin Royals, we finished under 500 too, so I'm over six. <laughs> but it goes in ebbs and flows. We just got back from a pretty tough road trip. I think we won two games. We don't try to be funny or try to insert ourselves in conversations that people don't want us in, especially when we're losing. We, we unveiled, this is kind of derailing, but we unveiled a Hall of Fame. It's our inaugural Hall of Fame class, our first Hall of Fame ever, and that's going to be later in September when we announced it August 3rd. And so on Facebook, we're posting every day about the Hall of Fame, I'm highlighting a different inaugural member. And so we have stuff like that where we're going to have to post it no matter what. On Twitter, we have graphics of Clemente and Stargell and some of the bigger names that are in the Hall of Fame. But if we're losing, we aren't going to meet. We're not going to roast the team. We're kind of going to read the room. And we're going to post the lineup. We're going to post the final score. But we're not going to insert ourselves in conversations and in places that people aren't interested in us being in. But on the flip side, when we do win, we're going to own those like, big brand moments because since we are losing, we need to take advantage of that. When we swept the Dodgers, that was our first sweep since August 2020, I think. We didn't sweep at all last year. So it was a huge thing that our fans were looking forward to. And the fact that it was Dodgers was huge. They're the best team in baseball. And so on Twitter, that three-game series, we had some of the highest impressions ever for that. Um, and so we owned that moment. But we got swept by the Giants this past weekend. And so we posted when we scored. We ended up losing a couple close games. But we're not going to meme. We're not going on the off day yesterday to post like, something funny. We posted the Willie Stargell with the carousel about the Hall of Fame. And then like a couple of young folks things since they won awards, but it wasn't anything crazy. So it's bigger about reading the room and knowing what your fan base wants because if we post like some silly goofy videos, they're gonna be like, you lost X and we're a team. I'm like, thank you, I do know that. <laughs> How do you manage work life balance since um, these games are at different times and they happen so frequently? I don't. Um, <laughs> we're getting better. Like I said, we doubled our team since April. So I work almost every home game now. We're starting to kind of do shifts and then road games. I think I worked five of the nine this past road trip, which we're on the West Coast, which was terrible. Um, so we, our director, manager, coordinator, each one of us took one of the 940 games in Arizona, and then whoever worked that night, they didn't come in the office the next day. So 
kind of balancing things like that on a home stand, unless I have meetings in the morning, which sometimes I do, I try to come in at like noon to two, just because I'm gonna be there until 10 to midnight, depending on if you have a rain delay, if the game just stays really long because baseball is really long, if we win, like we stay later. So it just depends. We've gotten better since COVID with working remote. And so if I have to do something, I try and do it at home rather than coming in the office and then sitting there for 15 hours. Um, but during the season, I do work a lot and it's hard. Um, why did you decide to come to the fire to say go to the Braves? I got the first. Oh. And I didn't want to wait. Some teams on the Twitter accounts have became strictly professional. Like the pirate meme culture is obviously really big on Twitter. How did you guys decide that that was going to be the voice of the community in Tucson? We've been kind of changing our voice for the last two seasons. Obviously, winning helps. And so you can get, a lot, get away with a lot more when you're winning and everyone thinks you're incredible and you're killing social media and in reality, like, you have a lot of content. Um, but for us, it's just, like I said earlier, knowing when, we're not gonna meme every time. I think we've only replied to three teams' final scores, and it's only if, if it's a big moment, like Brownie said the Zapazoo thing for that double play, it happened in the ninth inning, and it was huge. Um, that was for copy for the double play video, and then before that, David Bednar, we used like, David Bednar, put your team to bed with the Cubs in April of this year, because he shut down the Cubs, he got into a little bit of a jam, but he came through, and it was a huge game, it was after we had lost 20-0. So, that's just a big moment. He said some things in the high five line after, he was super hyped, and so we were responding to the Cubs final score, and then I think we did one with the Dodgers with Will Crow. It spells Will with one L, so we did it. We've used this in Poppy before, but Will handed your team the other L. <laughs> so we use that. Um, we have a lot more memes than we're ever going to use, just because we like to be ready. A lot of times, sometimes, like, we'll be tuned into the broadcast, so we have a radio booth up there. Um, we have the TV on, we have an iPod, and then physically watch what's happening, but we try to stay tuned into the broadcast because they're always doing something ridiculous, whether it's like they're showing off a bubble that they held up L's before that we screenshotted and was keep right and uses headband night we won and they were wearing the headband in the booth. So we screenshotted that and used that as our picture for the final score. So we try and stay like pretty tuned in to what the broadcasters are doing what people are saying online, but also the memes that people are posting and then what they think is funny because the David Bender one had been around since last year, which hadn't really found a chance to use it until he was our full-time closer this season. But it's a lot, like I've said five times already, reading the room. Like when you're losing or when it's not a big moment, it's just kind of like you're being annoying, what are you doing? But when Pirates Twitter is lit, like that's what we try to have some fun as well.